your attention, please. Worship will be starting in one minute. Please take this opportunity to prepare your hearts for worship and to be seated. And don't forget to put your cell phones on silent. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody today? Hopefully things are going well for everybody. What a beautiful, beautiful weekend that we've had here, and it's a gorgeous day out today. We need to make sure that we take advantage of that because I understand that the weather is going to be changing here the next week, but uh, what a wonderful, wonderful start to a week. And uh, we're glad you're here with us today, whether you're here in person or online. We welcome you to Grace Street Church. and. Uh, have a wonderful morning of worship going on here right now. Let's start it off by talking about some of the things we have going on here at Gray Street. Next week we have Orange Track Racing and the Orange Track Racing is going to be the final for the year. So uh, we have all the race offs going on and everything. It's always kind of a fun time. Everybody gets all stoked up about that. So we take all the prize winning cars out of the box that we've had held all year and we get to race all those off. So we have a big race off on on top of our normal racing that we normally do. So it's it's a really, really fun time. I invite you, if you've never experienced that, to come on out and join us. It's a, a really good time. And uh, it'll be right here at Huss Church next Saturday morning. Registration at 9.30, racing starts at 10. So I uh, hope to see you then. We have a planned out Thanksgiving meal that we're going to be having and we're we're doing the rem houses so there's 11 houses we'll be delivering a thanksgiving meal out to each one of the houses so that the special needs people out there and the staff who are working on thanksgiving day have a meal for that day and we're really really excited about the outreach project and being able to give back to the community and be the hands of feet and jesus in our community so it's a wonderful thing I want to start today by having a opening prayer now that we have some things that our world kind of decided on. Um, I would like to start us off on the right foot and uh, start off with a new beginning. So if you'd bow your heads and join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that our president, the vice president, all the cabinet, and the chief justice, the associate justice of the Supreme Court to receive the wisdom of God and to act in obedience to that wisdom and for the power of God to flow in their lives. And I pray for the members of the Senate and the House to find your peace and direction. And for these men and women to act and lead according to your word. A house divided against itself cannot stand, and therefore I pray for them to be united in righteousness for the sake of the nation. I pray that all of our leaders will honor and respect you as the one and only true God. We ask that you give us government leaders who will pray for your will and your guidance. And Lord, we ask that you pour out your spirit on this nation to help each one of us discern good from evil. Not as the eyes of man, but through spiritual eyes, Lord. We ask that you humble our hearts so that we will be a nation filled with gratitude and thankfulness. In Jesus' almighty name. So as we begin our worship service today, we just want to start off with humble hearts. And we want to start off uh, 
in praise and honor and glory to God. Because that's what we're here for. And our call to worship today comes from 1 Thessalonians 2.13. And it says, Therefore, we never stop thanking God that when you received his message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. And Paul, uh, when we think about what was going on here, Paul established this church of Thessalonica during his second missionary trip to, the, to that area. And that was about 51 years after Jesus' death. And he wrote the letter in a short time to encourage young believers there, because this is a brand new church. And when I say brand new, anything that's less than 100 years old is brand new. You know, I, I can't see as myself as being the age that I am and being an old person yet. I kind of keep sliding that barrier. Now, when I was 20, I was really old at this age. But now that I'm up at this age, I, I don't feel all that old. So, But he wanted to assure them of his love and to praise them for their faithfulness during the persecutions that they were facing. And the church in Thessalonica, as we remember, this is a gathering place of a lot of different cultures. And so it was on a major trade route back in those days. So you had Greeks, and of course it was on occupied territory for Rome at the time. And then you had the Jewish community that was there who opposed Jesus still. And we're still not believing. And so this young church had a lot of persecutions coming at them from a lot of different ways. And just as we have these kind of issues we face each and every day in our lives, we need to have assurance. We need to have that word of God poured out on us. We need to be lifted up and edified so that we can build ourselves up for what God has, has in our lives. And he wanted to remind them that you know, we're all there because he wanted to make sure that they knew that there was going to be a second coming, that Christ was going to come back into this world. And he was going to take us out of this world to be with him forever, to have that everlasting life. And by his words and example, Paul encouraged the Thessalonians to live in the way that God would consider worthy. So I have to ask you something this morning. Is there anything about your life that you do or that you've done that God would consider unworthy? And yesterday I posted up a, a message on Facebook and, uh, and it talked about how no matter what we've done, no matter who we are, Jesus by his act made us worthy. We were made worthy on the cross. And I was out working in Amana yesterday, and we were moving some things for the theater out there. And one of the people that I was working with at the time, she, she came up and she says, hey, I just want to thank you for those words of encouragement that you post up there. If you don't think they're doing any good, she says, they are. And so we need to do that. We need to reach out to others, whether we know whether it's affecting them or not. Be the hands and feet of Jesus every day. Live out your faith. And that's what Paul was asking the Thessalonians to. So I have a second question for you this morning. What do people think about God by seeing you and your actions in your life? What do they think about God by seeing you and your actions? If they know you're a Christian, they're saying, well, this is an example of a Christian. Are you living out that life? Are you living out what Christ wants you to do? I just want you to think about those, because Terry, Pastor Terry, he's got a great message for you this morning. And it helps to keep us grounded on those scriptures. The very word of God. So as we go into worship today, I want you to understand that these words that we, that we bring to you, these messages we bring to you, are more than just mere sermons. They're to stoke that fire in your heart to get on fire for God, to get on fire for Jesus, to get you motivated to go out there and to reach out to others in his name. Amen. Amen. 
So let's start off with a word of prayer. Lord, we just uh, come before you right now and we lift up Pastor Terry and the message that you have given him to give to us today. Lord, we ask that you would bless each one of the hearts and ears that need to hear that today. Help us to take it into our holy of holies in our hearts and live it out day to day. Help us to receive this message, to believe in the message that is given today and to live it out daily in our lives. Reach out to others so that they might know your words, that they might know the wonderful acts and the blessings you give us with your grace and mercy each and every day. Lord, we just ask that you would use us as your hands and feet as we go through the week ahead so that we can live out your word. Amen. Uh, thank you, Pastor Mark. So good to see all of you today, those of you that are here in person on campus and those of you that have joined us online this morning. As Pastor Mark said, it is a beautiful day outside. Got maybe one more of these before it gets a little colder and the rain comes in. But we can just relish in God's creation today. And no matter what is happening in the world, God is in control. And we have that hope. This morning, we're going to talk a little bit more about that hope and as Mark started off last week, he started off our series on the solas, teaching us about sola gratia, or grace alone. And this week we're going to continue with sola scriptura, or scripture alone. And it's very important to understand this. And I can't believe uh, how much additional uh, time I spent. Uh, I would go to bed either watching or reading more about this than I already knew. And I went a little bit further. Because there is actual opposition in the world, in the Christian world, against Sola Scriptura, I was reading and, and watching videos about those who oppose it and don't believe in it. And as I told Pastor Mark this morning, I, I understood their position. And then I also felt sorry for them that they had that position. And let's find out why. Because in Pro we as Protestants, we believe that Scripture is revealed directly from God, making it the divine authority of what we believe. So here's, here's some uh, points to go with that. The Bible, as Protestants, the Bible we believe is the inspired and infallible word of God. It is the basis for our faith and how we should act. It is also the final authority on spiritual matters. Now see, by, and Mark touched on, on the Reformation last week and he talked about Martin Luther and he talked about some of the pre-reformers um, like Jan Hus and there was also Wycliffe and, and others that came before Luther. But, by the time the Reformation came around, by the time Martin Luther uh, had gotten into the priesthood, many additions had been made to the Christian faith. And, and so he, after searching the scriptures, because he had a hard time with some of these. And in fact, he had a hard time with a lot of them. And, and so he posted the 95 theses that Mark mentioned last week. And he posted those on the Wittenberg church door. And this was in an effort to prompt discussion amongst his fellow clergy regarding the idea of indulgences. You see, he didn't have Twitter or Facebook or any other social media to throw that out there to the world. He just took and he posted it on one door. And here's the thing. The Catholic Church had been teaching that there was a treasury of merit in heaven. And this is, this is getting to what these indulgences were about. And in other words, they believe people who had lived really good lives had left over merit. Let that sink in for a minute. They had left over merit. In other words, people could then purchase, they get out their wallets, and they, the 
pre, the, the religious leaders would come around and, and they would pay these indulgences and that was to for their friends and their family who had already died to reduce their time in purgatory. Now, you're, they're preying on people's feelings. All of you have lost someone, and you, how, you know how devastating that can be. And how, when you're caught in that moment, you might agree to just about anything. Well, people were desperate. So, of course, they would do whatever they could to pay these indulgences so that they could lessen their friends and family's time in purgatory. Now, we know from Scripture that we're not justified by good works, merits, they just, that doesn't exist. We're, it's by grace alone, like Pastor Mark talked about last week. So if you haven't heard that sermon, once we're done today, go online, go out to our Facebook page and listen to that message. Because it is only by grace alone. These good works, these, these merits, they don't exist. And here's the thing, his students, took those 95 theses and they translated them from Latin to German. And soon they were everywhere in Germany. This is what uh, Wycliffe and Tyndall had done earlier, before Martin uh, was born. They translated the scriptures from Latin so that they could be read by the everyday people. Here's the interesting part. It was just 65 years before Martin Luther wrote these 95 theses that the first section of the Gutenberg Bible was printed on a printing press. That was back in September of 1452. Now here's an interesting thing because in order to understand the, the scripture alone piece, we have to know some things about the Bible. And we're going to get into some more details about the Bible here in a, in a little bit. But I found this interesting as I was uh, preparing for today. According to Wycliffe, and these are Bible translators, and, and this is as of last month, October 2020, one in five people are still waiting for the Bible in their own language. There are 7,360 languages that are spoken in the world. Only 704 of those languages have a full translated copy of the Bible. There are 1,551 languages that have a complete New Testament. And there are an additional 1,160 languages that have some portions of the Bible. That means they are still actively working on translating 2,731 languages. This is so everyone can hear the Word of God. Now, as Pastor Mark taught us last week, sola means alone. And we believe that scripture alone is the supreme authority. And we believe that so much that I'm going to go back to our statement of beliefs. And you can go out to our website and you can see this um, in the Who We Are section. Just click on the drop down, take it right to the statement of beliefs. It's the very first one. But here's what the statement of beliefs begins with. This is the statement we begin with. It says, Grace Street recognizes that it cannot and does not desire to bind the conscience of individuals in areas where Scripture is silent. Rather, each believer is to be led in those areas by God, to whom he or she alone is ultimately responsible. We believe the statement of beliefs to be an accurate summary of what Scripture teaches. And then we follow it with this next statement about the inspired Scriptures. The scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, are the inspired and infallible revelation of God to man and the authority of faith and conduct. Grace Street Church accepts the Bible as the revealed will of God, as the all-sufficient rule of faith and standard for daily living. And then we list off three different verses that cover just a portion of this. There's many more. But 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 17, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, which Pastor Mark talked about just a little bit ago, and 2 Peter 1, 21. See, we believe that God speaks directly to us through the Bible. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we were warned about false teachers. 
And if we lose sight of this, then the scriptures can become manipulated and twisted into something that they are not. And this is what separates us from the following religions. Think about this. The Mormons, they believe in the Bible, but they added the Book of Mormon. The Jehovah's believe in the Bible plus the Watchtower. The Christian scientists believe in the Bible plus the writings of Mary Baker Eddy. Seventh-day Adventists believe in the Bible plus the writings of Ellen White. And the Roman Catholics believe in the Bible plus the tradition of the church. Now these are problematic, whether they're the extra writings or the traditions. And here's why. Deuteronomy 4.2 says this, Do not add to or subtract from these commands I am giving you. Just obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you. And then again in 12.32 of Deuteronomy, Moses writes, So be careful to obey all the commands I give you. You must not add anything to them or subtract anything from them. And as we've talked about, the Old Testament and New Testament, the entire Bible is woven together. So let's just jump to the end of the book. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. And I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. And if anyone removes any of the words from the prophecy, book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that are described in this book. We are warned in scripture not to add anything to it. And as far as traditions are concerned, of the 12 times that the word tradition or traditions is used in the New Testament, only one of them is used in a positive light. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians 11, 2, and this is the NIV version. It says, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. Now, when Paul is talking about the traditions to the Corinthians here, he's, he's basically, it's the substance of his instruction and his teaching. The other 11 times, well, they're in a negative light. They are basically counterproductive to the word of God. So traditions can take us down a dangerous path. They can keep us uneven. So when I think about that, I think about the tripod that's standing right there. Now we're showing this online. We, we will, it'll be posted on our Facebook and it'll eventually make it to our YouTube page. But what if one of those legs was shorter than the other? Or two of those legs were shorter than the other? Then you're going to get this kind of view. It's going to be tilted. It's going to be skewed. It's not going to be what we need to see. So traditions are things that are man-made, not God. And if it's just like when Mark and I talk about scripture. Read around what we're talking about. Take and... and don't just take what we say at face value. Go into the word and study it for yourself. And when man gets a hold of things, it be, things become skewed. They take and they cherry pick scripture. They make it say what they want it to say. So to determine if scripture alone is sufficient, we have to answer the following question. Is the Bible true? Because if it's not true, so the scripture or scripture alone means nothing. So here's here's where we're going to go, and I'm gonna uh, we're going to be in Second Timothy three fifteen through seventeen, as we mentioned from uh, our statement of beliefs here in a moment. But let's go back to verse ten, where Paul warns Timothy. He says he warns a false teacher, saying, "Evil people and impostors will flourish; they will deceive others, and they will themselves be deceived." they will start to believe their own rhetoric. So this is what he, Paul writes to Timothy in 15 through 17. He says, you have been taught by the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have been given you, or they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. 
all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now, I love verse 15. Jewish children were taught the scriptures by their parents starting at the age of five. Now, this uh, tells me that it's the parents' responsibility to teach their kids. So not a Sunday school teacher, not a youth pastor, not the church, but, you know, not pastors of the church. And this was a bit of a battle with some kids when I was a youth pastor. Their parents thought that in two, an hour and a half, two hours a week, I could impart them all the wisdom that was contained in this book, and they would live godly lives. You got an hour and a half, two hours a week. Kind of goes like teachers. Now, this doesn't go for the homeschool kids. Homeschool kids had their parents. But for the kids that are in schools, the teachers are teaching, but it also helps when those things that they're being taught are reinforced in the home. And if we reinforce these scriptures in the home with our children as they're growing, then they will, they will never let it go. And even if they start walking through a bit of a desert time, they will always come back because of that rooted faith that they have. Those years of instruction in the Old Testament teachings would have shown Timothy Jesus' role in God's plan for his creation. And then verse 16 tells us that all scripture is inspired by God. Some translations say breathed out by God or God breathed. Simply put, God is the author of scripture. Okay, well how can we know that that is true, Pastor? Well, we can do that by doing a little investigating. And as we investigate things, we're going to uh, kind of do what we would do with anything. So I've got a few questions here. Some are fact, some are fiction. Now, by a raise of hands, I can't see those of you that are online, but I can see those of you that are here. Um, fact or fiction, it takes 11 feet of wire to make a slinky. If you think that is fact, raise your hand. Okay, we're about halfway there. Guess what? It's 63 feet. How about this one? Velcro was invented in Great Britain. Fact or fiction? If you believe it's fact, raise your hand. Nope, it was fiction. It was, that was in Switzerland. How about this one? The average American consumes about 23 pounds of ice cream per year. Raise your hand if you think that's fact. All right, you two are correct. That is correct. That's on average. That might not be you. Doesn't include the diabetics. There are some of us that like more ice cream. There's some of us that like sherbet. I grew up and that was, I don't know why, but rainbow sherbet was a, a, a treat when we got to go out to eat after church. And so even to this day, that's one of those things that's like, Oh, good. It's like, it's like the, most people think the smell of diesel, like coming from a bus or something, is disgusting. I like it. And that's because I have one memory of, of smelling diesel for the very first time, and that was riding in a cab in Des Moines going to the uh, Barnum & Bailey Circus with my grandfather. The windows were down, the buses were all around us, and it was a happy time. So, that disgusting, awful smell, it is. How about this last one? The first record ever featured a recital of Mary Had a Little Lamb. If you think that's fact, raise your hand. You would be correct. That was the first record that was ever made. So, we have to, in order to find out whether these are true or not, guess what we have to do? We have to research. Now, some of you will go down to the library. Some of you might even have encyclopedias at home, and uh, the rest of us probably just go to Google. 
but you can't believe everything you see online. I don't care what the State Farm commercial says. So here's the thing. We're going to look at three different areas of evidence to answer the question, is the Bible true? Is it God-breathed? And so those three things are we're going to talk about fulfilled prophecy. We're going to talk about the archaeological support. And we're going to talk about the historical evidence. And so we're going to, we're going to kick off with fulfilled prophecy. Now, we've all heard and we have all seen people and things that predict the future. They all prove to be vague. They all prove to be unreliable. And pretty much they all prove to be wrong. You can't go to the store, go to the toy aisle, pick up a magic eight ball, ask it a question, and get an answer. It doesn't work. But we're going to look at biblical prophecy. The Old Testament is full of them. And we're going to, we'll look at just a few of these this morning. The first one is comes from Micah 5.2. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. This is the prophecy that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And here's the fulfillment, Luke 2, 4 through 7. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee, and he took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. That was Jesus. Now, here's the thing. Well, people say, well, there was no census then. Guess what? There is actually historical evidence that has now proven that there was a census at the time of Jesus' birth. And he would, they would have gone back to their historical home. Jesus would be condemned with criminals, is, is the next prophecy. And as Isaiah, Isaiah prophesies this in 53 and 12, he says, I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. Luke 23, 32 and 33, two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. He interceded for rebels. He told us that we needed to love our enemies. But on that cross, when one of those criminals, one of those rebels, asked Jesus to remember him, what did Jesus say? He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Fulfillment of scripture. Jesus would have his hands and feet pierced. This was predicted before crucifixion was even invented. Psalm twenty-two, sixteen: My enemies surrounded me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. John 19, 18. They were nailed or they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side with Jesus between them. And there are many more. Jesus would be buried by a rich man. That's covered in Isaiah 53, 9, and also in Luke 23. And there are other prophecies predicted in the Bible that came true and are confirmed by non-biblical evidence. So we, even when we say that Scripture is true, there is non-biblical evidence to back it up. Mark 24 or excuse me, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 predict the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And this happened and is recorded by the historian Josephus. Josephus didn't believe that Christ was the Messiah, but he was a historian that recorded the events. And Jeremiah predicted the reinstatement of Israel as a nation in Jeremiah 31. And the longer it went, the more of a joke it kind of became with people until 1948 when Israel became a country again. Some 2,000 years of non-existence. So when it comes down to it, there's a ton of prophecy. In fact, Isaiah 53 predicts 15 different things about the Messiah that came true through the life of Jesus. 
15 things in one chapter of his writings. This is what I find interesting about that. A number of years ago, Peter Stoner and Robert Newman wrote a book entitled Science Speaks. And that book was based on the science of probability, and it was vouched for by the American Scientific Affiliation. It set out the odds of any one man in all of history fulfilling even eight of the 60 major prophecies. And then they, say, and they, they add to that and 270 ramifications of those prophecies that were fulfilled by the life of Christ. Here's the probability that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth could have fulfilled even eight of those prophecies. One in 10 to the 17th power. So put a one and 17 zeros, you get one in a hundred quintillion. Only God can make that happen. So, still not convinced that the Bible is true? Let's look at a little bit of archaeological support for it. The Bible says that Jericho was in a certain place, and archaeology verifies that. The fact is, not prove everything in the Bible is true. In fact, archaeology doesn't prove spiritual truths. What it does is it validates the words in this book. The more that we find true in this book, the more we can believe its validity. Archaeology has never proven this book to be false. Now, there are some things that are in it that it, archaeology has not yet supported, but it's never proven it false. Here's a, here's a couple. John, the author of the Gospel of uh, John, 1st 3 John and Revelation mentions in his Gospel that near the Pool of Bethsaida there are five porches. And for years, archaeologists believed he was wrong. That no such place existed but recently, about 40 feet underground, they excavated five porches. Now, the most ancient text, textual evidence we have of the Bible is a portion of the Gospel of John. And it's on an ancient paper called Papyrus that is dated to 200 AD. No other ancient document enjoys such compelling manuscript evidence. Now, there is a papyrus containing the Gospel of Mark that is over 100 years older, and they're still trying to validate that. They're, they're still arguing on its validity. But can you imagine? less than a hundred years from Christ's birth, less than 80 years from his death. And then we have the historical evidence. When it comes to the Bible, there's a lot of historical evidence, and this evidence comes from all kinds of different sources. Um, and I've always found it interesting that uh, other writers have such small portions of writing, yet they're believed without any problems. Think Aristotle, Herodotus. When I think of Herodotus, we have all of eight copies of his writings, and we have five of Aristotle's for a total of 13 copies. Anybody want to guess how many copies we have in the New Testament? 24,000 copies. Now, here's th this is going to take the, make it even a little more understandable as to why this is so believable. Herodotus, he wrote between 480 and 425 BC, and the earliest known copy of his works is 900 AD, some 1300 years after. And the same goes with Aristotle, 384 to 332 BC, and the earliest known copy of his work is from 1100 AD. That's a span of nearly 1400 years. Of the, the 24,000 copies of the New Testament, 230 of those, 230 are from before 600 AD. That's less than half the time that went between the other's writings. And there's other historical writers out there that have more or, or less writings, somewhere between you know, 3 and maybe 18, but yet we believe them unequivocally. And there's thousands of years between their writings and when they actually wrote them. Nothing is this, this close. 
And there are non-Jewish and non-Christian writings that support the scriptures. Josephus was a first century historian whose writings include references to Jesus. Tacitus was a Roman historian and senator who referred to Jesus, his execution by Pontius Pilate, and the existence of Christians in Rome. The evidence for the truth of scripture exists, it's there. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says in 4.12. He says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. The Bible is not just an incoherent collection of words. The Bible is God's word. It never changes. What about all the translations? We've got a chart, I can get it for you. In fact, we can post it up on our Facebook page here. I can put it up as a picture. It shows the Bibles in the middle and then going to the right to those that are uh, thought or idea written. And to the other direction goes to more towards a word by word. You get word by word, it's not the KJV. It's actually the New American Standard Bible. If you get all the way over to the right and to the most by thought, that's going to be uh, the message. And some are right in the middle of the translations that Mark and I like to use, which are the NIV and the NLA. But the Bibles that we use have been meticulously taken and translated from the original languages. The Greek, the Hebrew, the Aramaic. They're not just random writings where they took a version of the Bible and then translated it from that. They didn't go in and change the words from the King James Version or the Revised Standard Version. They went in and they translated from the original. So it never changes. The God's Word is alive. If you've ever read the Bible and you have you felt that, I have. You can feel that it's alive and it is powerful. It's life changing. It's life sustaining. It, it's eternal and timeless. The truths that are written in here, yeah, they didn't have the things that we have now, but they were going through all the same things that we are now. Just now they're a little more amplified with the technology that we have. God's word reaches into the deepest recesses of our being. If you take nothing else away from this, take away that you need to take time to read it. You need to take time to study it. You need to take time to listen to it, meditate on it, and pray over it. If you're not in this book, then you don't understand the, what it's saying. And if you're just listening to pastors tell you something, you're not hearing the message that they're telling you. Go back and read. Go back if you need references. I, I, I know we've been answering and putting some of it up on our Facebook page as we went through the sermon today. But go back and re-listen to if you need to. Find those references to Scripture. And look them up and read them. But then read around them. Get yourself a good study Bible. This Bible that I have, I love this NLT because it has on one side it's a study Bible down here at the bottom. And the other side it's a life application so I got it all in one spot, a little on the heavy side, but it's a wonderful resource. Take the time to spend in it. Father, we just thank you that scripture alone is sufficient, that we don't need to add anything to it. You have everything there. That is the basis for what we believe. Now, Father, we also realize that it doesn't cover everything, because it certainly doesn't cover technology. It doesn't cover our, our, how we do certain things. But, Father, it covers the things that we need to govern our lives in and through those different things. And that's the important thing. That's the thing that would help us to remember that, Father. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what it means to us. And, Father, don't let us take it lightly. Let us study it daily. Let us read it constantly. Let us pray through it and meditate on it, Father. And help us to see what you mean through it.
to us. In Jesus' name. Thank you for that wonderful message this morning, Pastor Terry. God's divine word that comes to us through the scriptures can help us to lead our lives, can get us the answers we need when we're searching. And it always points us to the correct things. That's one of the things I really like about the scriptures and what they tell us. So as we go forward today and we, we take a look at uh, this time that we come to for communion, I want you to think of the scriptures and what it tells us that Jesus went through on the cross for us. And, and even before, all of the suffering that he endured for us. And we're called by the act of communion to remember those things, to remember that sacrifice where God gave his only son through grace, out of love for us. And so as we're called to this time today, I want you to understand that uh, as we go through this, it's more than just taking But it signifies our belief in the sacrifice that was made by Jesus for us. And that God gave us this way to reconcile ourselves and our sinful nature back to him. Those things that separated us from God are now gone through Christ alone. We'll talk about some of that. So on the night that he was given up, Christ took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he said, Take and eat, all of you. This is my body, which is broken for you. And likewise, later in the meal, he took the cup, and after he filled it, he blessed it, and he said, Take and drink. This cup is the, my blood, the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And each time that you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. So as we come to this time of communion today, if you're at home and you wish to partake in communion, we have cups uh, which have a wafer bread built into them as well. And we'd be more than happy to deliver them out to you. Just let us know. So the body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ, shed for you. Amen. We come to a time now for our prayers and concerns, and our joys, and uh, it's our opportunity to share God's activity in our lives. Well, good morning. I'm here to share that with you this morning. So does anybody have any God sightings or anything they'd like to share with me this morning? Okay, if not, well, I understand we've had a lot of people to pray for this week. Um, I've seen it on Facebook and, and that. And, um, and I just want to say, too, you know, I have those days, too. You know, I'm tired. I don't want to get up in the morning. This morning is one of those days. But I know that if I didn't get up this morning, I would have missed what God had planned for me today, to come and listen to this wonderful sermon and to share with everybody, just to talk with people, and to enjoy time together and worship with everybody. And so I want to thank God for getting me up this morning. I want to thank God for the beautiful sunrises he has. 
I want to thank God for all the beautiful sunsets this week have been just gorgeous. If everybody just goes out and looks up, it's just, it's just beautiful. God is still in control. He is still God today. He was God yesterday, and he'll be God tomorrow. And he is always with us. And through this book, if we read this book, we have joy in the morning. We have hope in the afternoon. And I have peace at night. And he gives us peace to sleep at night and not be afraid of what's to come. So let's go to God in prayer. Father God, I just thank you for all you have done for, for me and my family and all the people that I know and their families. I thank you for the people listening. I just pray that you'll put your Holy Spirit upon all of them, Father God, and just come into their lives and speak to their hearts and minds so that they will get up and they will read your word like Pastor Terry said, we have to open the book. We have to read your word. We have to believe it. We have to understand it so that you will work in our lives to be your hands and feet. So thank you, Jesus, that you love us so much that you died on the cross. You shed your blood for all of us, for everyone, not just for me or, or somebody specific, but for everyone, Lord God, for you are so great. Thank you, Jesus, for your love, your unconditional love for each and every one of us, each and every day that we breathe. In Jesus' holy name, amen. As we prepare to, to, prepare to end this portion of our service, I've been reminded by Martha and, and listening to Denise this morning that we are a church on the move. And, and that brings, the, the song is not in our rotation this morning. God is on the move. It, it's not in our rotation, but that's what's spinning through my head right now. We have so many things to be thankful for. We're going to be delivering those meals to the rent homes. We're going to enjoy a meal amongst a small group of us here on Thanksgiving Day. In December, we're going to be able to show a movie called The Christmas Child. It's a Mexicano movie. And then in January, not every other month, but two months in a row, we, we're going to also have another movie, Do You Believe? It kind of falls in line with, do you believe what the Bible says? And it goes along with all the solos that we're going to be talking about. And so I'm excited for this church. And I'm excited for the people that are here. I'm excited for the people that are on camp online with us. God's word doesn't change. So our benediction our, and our closing out of this time of our service comes from Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. And this is from the message. It says, pray with me this passage. Says, may God who puts all things together, makes all things whole, who made a lasting mark through the sacrifice of Jesus, the sacrifice of blood that sealed the eternal covenant, who led Jesus, our great shepherd, up and alive from the dead, now put you together, provide you with everything you need to please him. Make us into what gives him most pleasure by means of the sacrifice of Jesus, the Messiah. All glory to Jesus forever and always. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for joining us. Those of you that are online, we'll see you next week.